oceans of the world, where since life began, a struggle for survival has raged, largely unseen by man. One of the longest and greatest survivors is Cacaridon Cacarius, the great white shark. He roams the seas of much of the planet, but is most common in the waters of the Southern Ocean, where this story takes place. Here in South Australia, a thriving fishing industry must share the water with the white shark. But the fishermen who risk the most are those who dive for abalone. They venture up to 30 miles offshore in search of the reefs which are home to the abalone and often a haunt of the white shark. Their boats, though strong and fast, provide little protection. The risks are high, very high. But so are the rewards. It's sometimes necessary to dive to depths of up to 130 feet to find abalone, the meat of which is so highly prized in Asia. It's cold, hard diving, but at up to $15 for one good shellfish, there's real money to be made for men who've got the courage. Because just beyond vision, there's the presence which they know is there, waiting. 300 million years ago, in the time of the dinosaurs, the great white shark evolved. One of the oldest animal forms on our planet, he is, as far as we can tell, perfectly adapted to and in control of his environment. He has no natural predator. But science knows very little of this creature. Not one has ever lived beyond a few days in captivity. We do know that he's the world's largest and most feared predator. His teeth are the biggest of any shark and enable him to tear out in one bite up to 40 pounds of flesh from the bodies of both fish and mammal. Seals, whales, dolphins are his preferred menu in these waters, but he'll eat big fish too. In fact, almost anything, especially if it's dead or injured. He is both lion and jackal of the sea. fishing town of Port Lincoln, the abalone divers have decided that the best defense against shark attack is a mobile cage from which they can harvest the shellfish whilst relatively safe from the predator. This film is the story of their courage and the ultimate test of that cage. Peter Thompson runs an export business for abalone. Neil Williams was the first abalone diver in this area and is regarded by many as one of the best. Herb Illick has been a professional fisherman for all his working life and Trevor Garner was another pioneer diver with Neil. That was OK, but the sharks, who knows? Well, what do you think about these bars? Are they going to be strong enough? They're made of stainless steel. What happens if you get a motor fight in a hungry shark? Nah, look, Herb, you'll have one look at this and swim off for his life. Look, the one that had a go at me down the Neptune wasn't frightened of anything. He just came straight up, opened his mouth and started to bite. Luckily, I had half a bag of abs, which I put straight in his mouth. And as he was eating, his teeth cut right through both fingers, right to the bone. He wasn't going to give up, and I was worried about the, all the blood from the hand. And also, how I was going to get 90 feet back up into the boat without getting eaten. I set off across the bottom, picked a few abs up to make the bag a bit bigger in case he had another go at me. And then, just keeping the bag in front of me, made my way up to about 50 foot of water. And at that stage, I couldn't see the shark. I filled up the parachute and let her go straight up, landed alongside the boat, and then just as I went to get inside, there's a little chafing bat that runs along the side of the boat, jumped straight over the boat, and the lead belt hooked in the baton. Luckily, 
the shallow, he looked around wondering what I was doing because he hadn't seen the shark, but saw the fear in my eyes, <laughs> reached over, grabbed the back of my lead belt and dragged me straight into the boat. At that stage, you know, there was blood everywhere coming out of my hand, which would have been a problem down below. And, uh, you know, I was lucky to get out of it as light as that. And I don't want another run in, at, you know, like that. I guess I really have to look at one of these things. Right, Hop. Yeah, let's go. So the decision was made to sea test the cage. It's made from stainless steel tubing and has buoyancy and reserve air tanks built in. It's powered by a hydraulic motor resting in a gimbal. The diver works a valve to control speed, and he can turn by swinging the whole motor. Buoyancy can be adjusted with a dump valve, which blows off excess air. Hoses from the surface pump down hydraulic oil for the motor, air for the diver, and even warm water to circulate in his wetsuit. Having proved the seaworthiness of the cage, the divers decided they'd have to test it against a great white. To this end, they contacted Rodney Fox, one of the world's foremost authorities on these sharks. Rodney's one of the few people who've been attacked by a great white and lived to tell the tale. Himself an ex-Abalone diver, he has no trouble in understanding the diver's concerns. To, uh, ...for collecting abalone, but uh, as far as the sharks go, we don't know. Well, you'll never really know until you expose the cage to a great white shark whether or not it's attracted to it. It may get tangled in the hoses. It may be attracted to the spinning propeller. I've seen a 20-foot big white shark crash into some filming cages I had and do quite a bit of damage. And until you expose the cage to the shark, you'll never be satisfied or, or be happy to work with it. So an expedition was mounted to take the men, their boat, and the cage to some of the offshore islands. Here, it was hoped, they'd be able to dive safely for the first time in the company of the great white shark. Okay, Herbie, let her go. Still a bit rough, Herb. What do you reckon it's going to do? Oh, I think we'll probably drop off. Probably go a bit southeast later on. I think the first thing we should do is go and get some apps. Right, with or without the cage. I'll do it both ways if you like. Somewhere nice and non sharky, eh? Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> Crayfish traps, or pots as they're called, are a familiar sight to abalone divers. A bait of an old fish head attracts the lobster into the trap. The cray fishermen store their catch in wells in their boats until they can go into port and send them to the processing factory for export all over the world. There you go! We got plenty of lobster! There you go, all right. What's that thing you got there? That's a shark cage, we're getting that! You reckon that'd keep a war shark out? Don't know yet, we're looking for one! You haven't seen any about! No, I haven't seen it here for a while. Now you're gonna go keep them one of these out. <laughs> we might have to put a few more bars in the cage. <laughs> the divers may well laugh now, but the time for laughing would soon be past. What would this monster do to the diver's frail cage? Perhaps ignore it completely or even flee? Unlikely. Fear is not an emotion with which the white shark is familiar. He has no need of fear.
would his massive jaws simply crush the steel tubing of the cage. Or the teeth puncture the air and ballast tanks, sending the breathless diver straight to the bottom. Or would he attack the hoses? For the divers, their time of reckoning was fast approaching. In order to test the cage against the Great White, it was first necessary to attract the sharks to the expedition boat. To this end, a foul-smelling concoction called Chum was brewed up by Rodney Fox. Over many years of attracting sharks for research and filming purposes, Rodney's perfected a mixture of oil, blood, minced fish and red meat. Tasty morsels are hung over the side of the boat to keep the sharks there when they arrive. Yeah, let's just throw this one off. Yeah, they're really a bit on the nose, and they? Oh. They ought to attract them. The chum is ladled out day and night. The wind and tide carry a continuous trail of it out into the southern ocean for the sharks to follow back to the source. The theory is that the sharks assume the hull of the boat to be a dead whale, and the chum and baits to be pieces floating away from the carcass. When all is ready, it's simply a matter of waiting for the action to start. Interested. There's a couple of big sharks out here. Come on, you guys, get out of bed. Oh, you. Come on. Come on. Hey, still here, come on down the stern. Oh, have a look at the size of them. That's a beauty, isn't he? Gee, it's a nice shark. See, it's a male. Let's have a close look at them. Oh, that'll do me. I'll be in that. We'll let no. him go first. Right. Evo, Pete. Evo! Pull it out the back so that we can climb in. Is that catch undone there, Herb? 
Some more mess in that cage with some more bars. Oh, they're bigger underwater, aren't they? Incredible. Oh, I've never seen anything like that. Did you see oh. when he put his nose up to the cage there, whether First. he put his teeth inside your cage or not? First time oh. he came right up, put it and actually, you know, you could have put your hand on his on his mouth like that. Oh, oh did you? No. No, 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 no. Bring back oh. old memories. <laughs> Different than when you was out here when that other one had a go at you. I mean, you had a cage this time. Yeah, I know. Oh. It felt a little it's bit more confident. It, it takes a while to get used to that, though. Um, 
Because that's my first time I've ever been in one, you know? You know, the biggest thing that I'm worried about is when you go down there in your cage is those darn hoses. Yeah. Because they're the um, most vulnerable part on that whole cage. Yeah. yeah, we're going to have to put an aqualung inside the cage, for sure. Just rig it up so that if something does happen, we lose all our air, that we can drift around out there until someone can get help to us. Medium rare, right? Big one for you, Peter. Big one for a big boy. Oh, they're not too bad now. That's great. Oh, these look bloody nice. Beautiful. Get into it, Herb. Mm. Here, Trev. Try this one. Thank you. Clean up hardy, boys. You might have to face the big shark tomorrow. Have you had any encounters with the white shark, Trev? Yeah. I've had a couple, but the one that really had, had me worried most was the one down at Thistle Island. I was working in uh, oh, fairly shallow water, and uh, he came in from behind me, went past me, oh, probably about six or seven feet away. I thought it was a dolphin or a seal to start with. And um, he circled me quite a few times over a period of about five or ten minutes, and he really had me worried because the first time he came in and you know, straight towards me and stopped about six or seven feet away and then went off again and I thought, well, this is perhaps the way that Terry Emanuel went, you know. Uh, but they look huge. Oh, you, know, you, you, you just don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. It's there's, been, uh, there's been a few others seen down that spot too. Just in that area? Yeah, yeah, right where you were. Yeah, been quite a, I think there's been a couple there. It was crystal clear yeah. water too, you know, yeah. really shallow. Sort of area you would have stuck your kids over. Yeah, well, it was pretty dirty up at Streaky when poor Terry nearly got virtually bitten in half. Well, Terry Emanuel. Yeah, he was the one that ab diving up streaky a few years ago, or what, 74 or something like that. And uh, he was diving pretty dirty water that day and uh, unfortunately he got, uh, got bitten. He surfaced and uh, yelled out shark and uh, the shallow was about 20 or 30 feet away. And he come over to him and uh, when he got there, there was just a big pool of blood, or oh, 15, 20 foot in diameter. And he was in the middle of it. And uh, the shallow grabbed him, grabbed me, put him over, grabbed me by the weight belt. To, to pull him into the boat and uh, the shark come up right there as he's trying to pull him in the boat and grab him. They had a bit of a tug of war. And uh, when the shell got him into the boat, there was virtually only half of him there. He virtually died on the spot. Pretty nasty thought, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, well, that's it. <laughs> Looks like it's you, Herb. Clear, Neil. Day to day, Herb. Two big ones around, too. One way down. Having gained an idea of what those jaws could do, it was thought wise to first expose the cage to the sharks without a diver in it. Herb entered the relative safety of the observation cage to see what would happen. Okay. Whoa, did you see that? Hey, do you still want to try it? 
All possible safety precautions were taken. There was no putting it off now. The moment of truth had arrived. Because if you run out of air, you're in trouble. There's all the other equipment. Yeah, all seems to be right. Throw all those wires on. Also, I've turned on this regulator here and make sure that you know where it is all the time. Okay. Right, ready to go. Everything all clear, Rodney? Yeah, lift her up. Yeah, all clear down here. Let her rip. Looks like he's still in one piece. Hook, hook him in the back. There you go, Herb. Oh. He's our big fruit. Nah, I think you got a bluff <laughs> now. <laughs> they certainly pushed the cage around when they hit it. He wasn't bite on the back of it. Yeah. I can feel him. Oh, yeah, cage well, shook like hell. Hey, what is it? Here, look at it. I tried to turn hey, it around. Look where it smashed into this dump valve. It's all breaking off. Yeah. Did you see him come down on top? We no, I just there. saw his tail and I felt the big thump, thump, shook the cage around. <laughs> well, it's got a big piece off of it now. You know, you had one on each side, if you were one behind you there one side. <coughs> this is just a year. Made the cage look very small. <laughs> Where are they now? I don't like having my legs in the water here. Yeah? There was two that just came right to the front and just crashed in the into the tanks and just glanced off. It didn't really go to take, I thought, you know, they might have taken a bite, but half open, mouth. Yeah. They really looked big from up, up top there, you know, when you saw the length yeah. of the cage and then you saw the length of the shark, <laughs> and it come in and bang. Yeah, and you say one nearly grabbed hold of your flipper? Well, I thought he had hold of a flipper, but it was the propeller wash. The flipper was shaking, 
with yeah. a wash. What about your heart? And I, yeah, I pulled my flip rim and nothing there. <laughs> what, yeah, no leg. Yeah. <laughs> the cage seemed to stand up well. Now more sharks had arrived, and it was decided to try the cage again. Yeah, there's a big one coming in on him now. Dive, Herb, dive! Sharks are getting more used to the cage. They're getting more snappy, you know. Still. Hey, your heart is. Well, he turned around with a line and he came straight back to the cage. Yeah. And he just shook the hell out of it. Pretty spectacular from up here. Oh, you, you were lucky he didn't take you off and tow you into well, the ocean. I had my knife out ready to cut the lines in the cage. Because <laughs> that's what I thought he was going to do. Oh, you all right? Makes the adrenaline pump, doesn't it? Good stuff. Well, have a look at that, Herb. Well, okay. there's the, there's the, is the airline's gone? Right down, there, right down here, there's there. another another cut down here. And he's really chopped those hydraulic lines up. I thought he'd cut it off there at one stage, but then I felt the cage really shake again. I knew he hadn't. Yeah, but at least you felt, did you feel safe in the cage itself? Yeah, I think you're quite safe in there. Yeah. But he could probably tow you a long way if you got that uh, hooked up here. What a mess. Look, you just slice through that. Look at that one. Come on, let's go and have a cup of coffee. Oh, my knees are still shaking. Well, I felt him tug on the line, and I turned around to see that he had hold of it. I thought, well, here goes. He's just going to go straight through it, but... Uh, 
he just kept biting. He just he got tangled up in it and took more line and more line, and uh, until he started dragging the cage down. Yeah, there's froth, froth and bubbles everywhere. Yeah, yeah and then yeah, all the oil was. I couldn't see much after that. I saw that he turned back around and came to the cage as I got, as, as I was about to cut the line, and uh, all I could see was a big mouth, about four foot off the back of the cage. And I went back in and again quick, and uh, not long after that he let go. He just must have freed himself. Actually, going by the look of these, these serrations on the hose, I had a fair sort of a mouth. Look, <laughs> it really proves that that cage is safe to, to Avalani dive out of because you've been in, involved with five sharks down here swimming around, attacking it, and they've only taken the hose. And if you've got enough air to survive and you can get up to the surface, yeah. you, you'll be safe. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Abalone divers of Port Lincoln use the cage, but some still prefer to take their chances. Perhaps they haven't been face to face with the great white shark or know the power of those jaws. But those who felt that cold stare of death know that when you're 100 feet down and all alone, a few thin steel bars could mean the difference between life and death. <laughs> 